we magnify you in this house. God, I don't care about any other reputation for this building, this church, this history, but let it be said that those people love God. They know how to pray. They know how to praise. They know how to allow the power of God to have access to their heart and their life, and they don't live it on Sunday. They live it every moment of every day of every hour of their life. Father, we honor you today. We magnify you in this house. Amen and amen. We're not going any further. We're not, I'm not interested in anything right now, but just giving him the praise. Can you just bow your head, forget about everything else, put your phone aside. Don't worry about that last text or the next one. Just think about the Lord right now. Father, we just come before you today. We're thankful, God, that those that have been out away from us are home. We're thankful, God, that you're watching out over those who are not here, those that are in the hospital, those that are recuperating. God, we know that you're working. God, there are those who are lacking the supply of things that give them mobility, but we believe, Lord, you've already put it in motion and it's heading towards them. Father, we thank you today, God, that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Let our glory not be in our accolades or our accomplishment, but let it always be in what you've already done and the promise that forever is settled and remains. Lord, we thank you today. I pray, God, break off of us any worldly American lethargy that might have set in because of our desire for particular comfort levels or this or that. And Lord, let us just rawly fall before your face in honesty and openness. And God, we just call upon you now. Holy Spirit, come and have your way in us and help us, Lord, to lay aside the weight and the sin and anything that does so easily beset us and distract us, O oh God, and allow us, Lord, in this moment to focus our honor and our, and our attention to your glory and to your word. And Father, we'll thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Your pastor's been out on vacation. I haven't preached now for two weeks, so I'm anxious to break open the word, but not to hear myself preach. I, I love to talk. If you know me at all, I'm a talker, but I'm interested today in sharing the things that God has for us, and never will we be able to satisfy that in its totality and completeness, but we certainly want to make every attempt to do so. We're so thankful that you're here. If you're joining us online, we appreciate you being a part of this and a part of that, and we're just uh, thankful because I believe that the word of the Lord is a precious commodity today, don't you? And I believe that the more that we hear it, it doesn't make us uh, uh, less like uh, Jesus. It makes us less like the world. It makes us more like the Son. Amen. And I thank Him for that today. And can you just give the Word of God a hand clap of praise and give your appreciation in that way today? Amen. And amen and amen and amen. I want to uh, draw your attention following service today. I have available for you uh, some scriptures that I put together uh, front and back, and they're just some, some select verses to prepare your heart for Christmas. You know, we, we in America are many times driven by the calendar that we uh, are accustomed to, and we look forward to our, our paid days off and those moments and times that we are accustomed to regular holiday breaks and this and that. But I believe that if we're not too careful, we can borrow. I'd love, I'd probably one of these days I'll preach a message on Charlie Brown's Christmas because there's a lot of good stuff in Charlie Brown's Christmas. And Linus gets in there and he becomes the, the, the main protagonist in declaring those things that are incongruent with the things of their, of their time and their season. And one of the things he, he, he goes on about is the idea of commercialism in such a way as to drown out and to cast its light on other areas. But, but let's remind ourselves today that Jesus, is to use a well-worn phrase, Jesus is in fact that reason for the season. So I've taken the liberty to put some verses together so that you can read through these. And these are topically kind of driven and you could go through them, making them even possibly a devotion for each of your days in a week, Monday through Friday, and if you read them once, you can read them again. Amen. You, they don't wear out. They just get. They just get better. They just get sweeter as the days go by. So I want you, after service, if you will, to grab one of these, Pastor. Why do you do that? Well, one to encourage you, two to give us an opportunity to find some scripture that might be uh, that might resonate with us that we can put inside of our heart, memorize it, so that it, it is not simply written words on a page, but it is the Word of God inscribed in our hearts. Amen. And there's nothing more precious to the believer than the truth of the Word of God. And I think it's powerful that we recognize today that, that we need now more than ever the Word of the Lord as the foundational cornerstone of our life. Amen. It's not a mystery that John starts out identifying Jesus as the Word. And we recognize that Jesus is many things, 
but he is a chief cornerstone. He is the matter by which all things are drawn. The whole building is set in motion by the perfectness and the placement of the master builder as he put Christ in this earth to set forth and to build that which would become the congregational bride of Christ and the temple of those who are in combined unity, worshiping and representing the work of the Father on this earth. Can I tell you today that your life has vitality and has importance because you are not simply and solely an individual breathing breath and living out your days until you die, but you are an ambassador of and an ember to the things of the world and an ambassador of God to the world that we live in. The other day as I woke up on a cold, chilly morning, one of the beautiful things that I was able to do is, is take a, a stick and do what? I began to stir the embers of the fire from the night before. And I found out that once those embers are stirred and once those embers are, are given uh, access, uh, oxygen is given access to those embers along with some combustible material, guess what happens? A flame begins to erupt and arise and begins to, to, to dominate anything and around it. I'm telling you today that we live in a world that is not looking for the church to sit idly by and say nothing while it marches to the beat of a drum uh, that has not been orchestrated by God. But I believe the world is looking because it's lacking for the church to rise up and the power and the authority of the Word of God and the Spirit of God and be that burning, flaming ember that is moving throughout the streets, glorifying God in our wake. Amen. Can somebody give the Lord praise in this house? Amen. Not at all where I'm necessarily preaching today, but I believe it's necessary. There are going to be some, there's going to be a fire series come up uh, pretty soon. I want to talk about how do we build a fire? What's components of the fire? What is God in the fire? Because we see the fire utilized many times throughout the word of the Lord. And I can tell you today that without being critical, without being harsh, the body of Christ is less in need of the perfection of a system and more in need of yieldedness to the spirit of God to make mold and shape us in the image of Christ like never before. We need not seek political correctness. We need to align ourselves with the word of the Lord. And as the word of the Lord is given precedence and prominence in our life, we will see the power of God in our life as well. Somebody say amen. I thank God for his goodness. I thank God for your faithfulness. There are a lot of ways for you to give today. You can give in our stationary ushers posted at the back door. You can give electronically out of the foyer. You can give through our website, cwc at riverview.com, cwcriverview.com, through PayPal, or you can give physically, tangibly, in a check written and mailed to the physical address, not the physical address, but the P.O. Box 605 address for the church. I want to thank you for your giving because your giving has enabled the church to continue to do and to function the way that it can, could, and should. Amen. You're seeing today that we have some things in place to, to begin the process of uh, finalizing and finish, finishing the front of this and uh, possibly continuing in the stages that exist as we continue to develop the rest of this as well. How is that done? Part of it is done, in fact, by the faithfulness of God's people. And I'm going to talk about giving today because giving is, in fact, in the three years that I've been here, I don't know that I've ever preached a message on giving in this concept or this construct necessarily, uh, but it's not because it's not needed. I've just always strived to be obedient to the voice of the Lord, but I sense the Spirit of God speaking to my heart last night and reminding me that it's necessary for the body of Christ to recognize in a day and a time, especially in hours of desperation. One of the first things that we'll do when we find ourselves in dark, desperate times is we have a tendency to pull back. And if we look at the gospel story, the revelation of Christ in Luke, and as it's recorded throughout every gospel except John, we recognize that Jesus' light came in a moment of darkness. And there was a time when between the writing, the finishing of the writing of Malachi and what we see picked up in the historical references found in Matthew, a 400-year period of darkness existed were neither prophet, priest, nor king. Those who were in offices of responsibility and reflection of God, unctioned and anointed by the Spirit of God until yet the Spirit would come. And in those roles of prophet, priest, and king, no one had uttered a word for over 400 years. But then suddenly, a light shone in the sky, and that light began to draw and attract all kinds of people who wanted to be in touch with God. And I tell you, one of the five billion reasons you need the word of the Lord is because it is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. And the light of God always draws those who are hungry 
for God. Those who have been in darkness yet want to dwell in the comfort and the glory of the light of God. Amen. And I believe that it's necessary for us to recognize that oftentimes in tragic situations, we find ourselves hoarding rather than uh, allowing God to work in our lives as we continue in the process and the practice. It's a practice. It's a discipline of yielding our self available to the Lord. I love that when the need was given, that uh, uh, with the notice of the children who were cold without jackets, we rose to the occasion and there was a response because many times people will give to a need before they will a vision. We could say, we're going to reach uh, South Africa uh, with the mission and, and, and money may trickle in and, 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 and man, it would or, or come in in great hordes. But we may say, hey, we need a water heater replaced and the money would just trickle in in pennies and dimes. Uh, uh, sometimes we'll, we won't give to a need as much as we will a burden or a passion and and so I get that it's good. And we live in a, a, a state that is often inundated, unfortunately, with uh, hurricanes. And, and I've watched in various historical pasts as people will rise up uh, greatly and do valiantly in the name of uh, uh, love for one another. And those things are good. But when trouble hits, when this desperate times come, we have a tendency, if we're not careful, to, to withdraw rather than to release. Amen. You remember the woman and the, the widow of Zarephath? She had just a little bit of oil and meal in her, in her, in her uh, cupboard. And her intent was to take that little bit and through mathematical calculation, knowing what it would produce and what it wouldn't, she gave a, prog uh, a, prog uh, what's a, what's a prognostication, <laughs> a forth telling, a prophetic utterance. She said, I'm going to eat this and we're going to die. But God had other plans. And he sent a man of God across her path, representing the work of the Holy Spirit. And he offered to her, and you know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, he offered to her an opportunity to obey God. And I believe today that we need to recognize that every great thing that God is going to do in our life is always built upon the last thing we've been identified as responsible to obey. And he said, if you'll give to me first a, 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 one of your cakes of meal, and if you'll give to me first, if you'll do that, God's going to work in your life, we know from that story. He didn't say, he didn't offer her the promise if you'll do this, but he said, if you give that to me first. And in the moment of her desperation, when she could have hoarded, when she could have held back, she decided it's better to give than it is to hold and retain. What you hold in your hand, you can never release in your land. I'm not trying today to sound like a clever televangelist. If you know me, even a smidgen, you'll recognize that I don't love, don't like, don't look to the shenanigans of people who, who utilize platforms to manipulate others. But what frustrates me is that oftentimes they'll take the truth of Scripture and they'll manipulate it in such a way that there's so much truth in there, it's hard to differentiate the good from the bad. And here's what I know. If I will obey the voice of the Lord, God will bless me. And when this woman reacted to the prophet of God, you have to understand something. He was not somebody unknown. He was somebody known and known in that area and known in that ministry and known in that capacity. And when he spoke, she could have obeyed or she could have disobeyed. And when she obeyed, it opened the door for God to bless her. I want us to recognize today as we move into the season that God is in the business of blessing those whom he has already blessed to be a blessing, that when they bless, it gives him reason and opportunity to bless even more. My goal is not the blessings of God. I'll serve the Lord, and in that service, I'll find the favor of God. But what I need to recognize is that in a day and age where we are, we are uh, uh, thrust into an environment where many times we may find ourselves uh, looking to this or looking to that, I just want to challenges your pastor today in obedience to the spirit of the Lord's direction to stay the course and to do and continue to do and to remain faithful in allowing what the Lord has blessed you with to move through your life, not find a place and retain, be retained and never move again. Let it flow through your life because we are strangers and pilgrims passing through with no continuing city, but we look for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. And while I'm here, I'm a steward. Somebody say steward. I've been entrusted. I've been enabled by God to take what he's put in my hand and bless him through it. Amen. And not only bless him, but bless others through it. Do you know that in a dark world, people become only concerned many times about themselves? 
But when the light of God is shed abroad in their heart, things began to change. Do you remember the tax collector that Jesus sat down to dinner with? And when the change of God had began to work its work in him, he stood up and said, I, I, if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to repent, change, pay them back, and release what I could keep for myself. When real change comes to our life, we begin to reflect the characteristics and the nature of our Father. Amen? Somebody say amen. As our children grow and they age, and our youngest son and his wife, while we were on vacation this week, uh, uh, I was on vacation. Miss Teresa's still working every day. Uh, they moved from Indiana to Arizona. And so we have two sons now, uh, and their families in Arizona. And uh, that helps us because now we get to see two for one uh, when we go out there. So I'm excited about that. And I thank you. Many of you are aware of that and praying. And I appreciate your participation in that. But what I want us to understand is that as I look at my boys, I've seen a few more pictures of them this week that I might normally see. I see the reflection of their mother because they're all just handsome, good-looking people. And then I see the attributes of their father, which may not always be complimentary to them, but I see me and them and them and me. And then when I hear them or I see them, I recognize that they are a reflection of the influence that they have been accustomed to and availed themselves to. And I recognize that if I want to be like God, if I, if I want the blessings of the Lord, if I want to reflect Christ in this world, it has to be more than a theological approach to declaring uh, uh, the truths of the Lord. I also need to not only mouth those truths, I need to model those truths. Amen? Somebody say amen. So it's not enough for me to have known about God or to know God. I need to stay in a consistent manner of living out than being in Christ every day of my life. It's not about what I've come to know. It's what I continue from what I know to live out on a day-to-day -day basis. When you get into heaven, there will not be a written exam. It not, your entrance will never be based on your ability to give the right answer to theologically uh, 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 strong questions. The life of Christ is going to be evident in us by his love shed abroad in our heart or it isn't. And the reality is, is we are identified by Christ, not by the church we attend or the Bible we carry or the bumper stickers we have or the radio station we listen to. We are connected to Christ by the reflection of him through us. Amen. And the world doesn't need a church with a bigger steeple and a better sign and this and of that and another thing. It needs a church that is living, breathing and, and giving out the life of Christ. Amen. And I want to challenge us that no matter who we are, no matter how old we become, we never outgrow the need to continually grow in God. As we talk about the coming year, I've already shared some things with Miss Teresa that I feel like the Lord has laid on my heart. But I want you to recognize one of the things that I try to do year to year is continue to keep our themes ahead of us. We've got our very first year, we talked about growing. The next year, we talked about focus. This year, we've talked about standing. And, and, and as you build those together, you realize that these are activities that are a part of the heart of the believer to continue in on a daily basis. I didn't get saved, sanctified, satisfied, and, so, and told to sit on the sideline. I've been brought into the family of God. I have, been in, I have been given life by the Spirit of God, and I am to be a vocal representative of the Lord in the world that I live in. Amen? Now's not the time for the church to set back, shut up, and sit down. It is time for us to stand and declare the Word of the Lord. But the reality remains is that while we're doing all these and we're pontificating on the love of God and the grace of God, listen, I've, I've heard a lot in the last decade about the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. And, 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 and like Paul said, listen, if we need to go back and revisit those elementary things, we will. But he said, let's build on those things and grow from there. Let's focus on our walk and let's move from there. Let's stand in the truth of God's word and let's be stable from there. But let's not be, let's be in our malice. Let us be children but in our understanding, let us be men and women of God. Amen? So it's not what I've learned. It's not what I've known. It's not what I've done. It's not about your resume. It's about God. And it's about what is fresh and relevant and what's he doing today. And I tell you today that the world doesn't need a church that can just love and be gracious and merciful. It needs all of those. But the body of Christ needs to move beyond the basic tenets of what defines us and what reveals God to us. And we need to move into the meat and potatoes of doing the Word of God. Amen? What are we talking about in days, months, maybe even the next year in completion? The idea that we need to work it out. We need to be at work living out our lives. The world is not reached by a church with a great little program 
even though those can function and facilitate the help and, and, and become a means to an end in some degree, the world is best reached by believers sharing their faith and living out the love of God and letting their light shine in darkness. Can I tell you today that Paul and, and Mary Helen are here because somebody said, this is, I love this church, God's doing this here, and they began to invite them. Do you understand that our best ability to reach people is not simply to exist, even though that's a good function, amen, but it's to reach out to people, let them know that we're here, that we love them, that we care about them, that we're willing to engage them and have relationship, conversation, and contact, amen, that we are not, though we may have to socially distance based on our comfort zones and wisdom, we're not to, we're not to relationally distance ourselves from people, and we certainly aren't able... And needing to relationally divide to, to separate ourselves from God. We need to draw near unto God. And that's my heart today. And I realize and recognize there's no way I'm going to get through the notes that are here. If you would like a copy of this, there's some great stuff in here. I, I think that it can help you. But I want, to, I want to talk about the reality today that our glimpses of God in this holiday season are focused and fostered on the reality of the fact that our, in our, our initial uh, uh, witness of the Lord is in His generosity. Amen? Somebody say amen. When I first am introduced to God, I recognize His grace. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And who am I that, that you would think of me? David said, I'm a worm and I'm a dog. Why would you even consider me? But we recognize that the love of God and the grace of God reveals the mercy of God. And in all of those things working together, the Lord is opening the door for you and I to have a relationship, even though what we deserve is what Jesus received. Amen? And we love that and we, and we build on that. But when I come to know God... My desire is not simply to fill my head with information. It is to walk out in my life and in my heart a real relationship with God that is fostered and continued on a day-to-day -day basis by intimacy with my Creator. Amen? Intimacy with my Savior. I'm not called the, 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 the roommate of Christ. I'm not called the best friend of Jesus. I'm not called an acquaintance of Christ. I am called the bride of Christ. Amen. I'm a part of the body of Christ. I am part of that betrothed one who will one day be united with the Lord. Those are positions of intimacy. There are a ton of people that I know. There are historically all kinds of people that I'm connected to, but there's nobody like my wife. There is no one that I'm one with. There is no one who knows me like she knows me. And there's no one that has the same level of intimacy with me that she does. You understand the pictures that God utilizes for our life are not pictures of just friends holding hands in the park, but they, it is an intimate relationship utilized to produce an outcome and an offspring, and that offspring are those who would come to know Christ. I'm telling you today, it's now not time to stand behind some mask. I'm not, this has nothing to do with anything political. But figuratively, we need not behind, stay behind some mask where we're comfortable in our anonymity and in, in our in our lack of identity and our anonymity and, and just sit silently on the sidelines while the parade goes by. Can I tell you today that, that, that if Bartimaeus had not cried out to Christ in that moment, he would have missed his opportunity to ever do so again. When Jesus was moving from where he was and, and into that time past Bartimaeus in that moment, he was going to Jerusalem and he would never pass that way again. I'm telling you today that the world is sitting blindly on the sideline and there is a need for a healing in their life. There is a need for their opening of their eyes. There is a need for them to move out of the status of being a beggar into becoming a father of Christ. But can I tell you that the church is the same way. We need to let God knock the blinders off. Paul was a mighty man of God, yet the Lord still had to remove those scales off of his eyes. And we need to allow the Spirit of God to do the same in us. And if we're not careful, we can become hoarders. We can become people who retain things for ourselves, stay in a place of comfort and remain in that uh, isolated place of solitude apart and feel very justified for it. God has called us to give. And our first inclination and revelation of God is His giving. And our first uh, 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 awareness of the power of God is we see Him act with His power upon darkness. And we see light suddenly flood in in Genesis chapter 1 in Matthew chapter 1 we see the floodlights of God turn on in the darkness I don't know if you've ever been around a football field Roger have you ever been near a football field I'm not sure maybe a time or two 
it's amazing how that, that field could be plunged in darkness until they throw that switch and suddenly, poosh, it's a loud sound, boosh, and those lights begin to come on. And suddenly, that whole arena is flooded by the opportunity to be exposed to the light that's now been turned on. And by the same token, once those lights are thrown, that place previously bathed in light is now enclosed in darkness. Can I tell you today that God calls you and I to be bearers of the light and bringers of hope. I've said it before, we need to be hope dealers, amen? We need to be hope dispensers. We need to be people that God can count on to relate to the world that we're in because the fact remains is that it is Christ in us, the hope of glory, and if we've been comforted by God, we have the authority, A, the responsibility to comfort others with the comfort that God has given us. It is not time for the body of Christ to sit silently on the sidelines. It is time for you and I to stand up and shout and cheer and glorify God. It's more than mouthing Christian words learned from religious temples uh, 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 repetitiously declared without feeling or purpose or meaning. It is time for you and I to say, Lord, here am I. Send me. He said, I'm looking for a man to make up a hedge. I'm looking for somebody to stand in the gap. I'm looking for somebody who will raise their voice in the the prophet said, Lord, here am I. Here am I, God. Can you do that right now? Can you raise your hand and say, here am I, God. Here am I, Lord. Oh, God, move in my life and move through me in the lives of others. What are you saying, Pastor? My message entitled, Finding Financial Balance. But the finances of God are not only related to dimes and dollars. There's a financial transaction. There's a, there's a value transaction. There's a worthy transaction. As we recognize and align ourselves with the purpose and the person of the purposes of God, the person of Christ, and make ourselves available to the power of the Holy Spirit to work through us. The power of the Holy Spirit to work through us is the ability for God to take our imperfections and still utilize them anyway. Amen. I'm telling you today that it's not about your ability to communicate flawlessly. It's just about your ability to love uh, uh, and, and, and speak and share when opportunities prevent, prevail and, and present themselves. We're not called. Some people have unique anointings and I've seen them uh, to get up on a soapbox and, and, and grab a microphone and do this and do that in public. I'm telling you though that the greatest expression that you and I can have is that when we reach into the lives of people around us and we allow the love of God to move through us. Amen. Our first glimpses of God are not only the power of the impact of his light on darkness, but the power of his gift and his generosity to us. There's not a person in the world, it would seem, and there are, I don't have time just to statistically go into it. We assume that everybody in the world knows what we know about God and everybody has a Bible. But, but the, I think I shared a couple of weeks ago, 86% of the, of the population of the earth doesn't have a Bible. So we might take for granted, and I guarantee you that, that the Spirit of the Lord is stirring the American church because we have taken God for granted. You can say amen or you can not say anything, but the bottom line is it, don't rem it won't delete from the truth. The body of believers and the church in general have come to a place where we have grown accustomed to the goodness of God and we are, not, we are, we are, we are basking in His blessing, but we are not obeying His word. You don't have to say oh, man, amen, but I know it's true. And the reality is, is that our first glimpses of God are, are as witnesses and recipients of His generosity. For God so loved the world that He gave. Somebody say He gave. And you know the rest, His only begotten Son. That whosoever, not by criterion of perfection or excellence or, or, or job performance, but whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. But then we see in Isaiah chapter 9, Verse 6, that, that to us a son is given. Amen. So yet again, here we have the, the process of God showing forth a pattern, revealing to us something that we can mimic, model, and, and replicate. And that is that God is a giver. Somebody say God is a giver. So nowhere in the identity of God and the revelation of his character, will he divorce himself or separate himself from the characteristic of his own identity? He's not modeling these things for us to show us what we should do. 
He is modeling these things for us because that is who He is. That is a revelation, a steadfast revelation of His character. And it's not for you and I to pick and choose and say, well, I may or I may not do this. This isn't today a conversation or a discussion or even a a, a combative back and forth on the idea of tithing New Testament, Old Testament, giving this or that. All giving must be done out of love or it is done for the wrong reason. Amen? God is always giving us boundaries and opportunities and abilities to see things that are pleasing to Him. Somebody said, well, I don't know about the Old Testament. And you got a group today that would like to just throw out the Old Testament. But I'm telling you today that the old is the new concealed and the new is the old revealed. Amen? And where there may not be the continuation of various moral practices or dictates of law given to, to, to drive a ceremonial practices, the moral compass of the Old Testament is the same moral compass of the New Testament and is the same moral compass of the new church. Amen? And we never see a divorce from that. We do not see a separation from that. We see a continuation of that. We see an accentuation of those things. We see an amplification of those things, but we do not see their removal or their dismissal. Amen? So in the Word of God is a revelation of God because in it we see Him reveal Himself to us that we might know Him. Amen? And know Him in the fellowship of His suffering. Amen? And the expression of His love and the light of His countenance and all of those things. But we recognize in Proverbs chapter 10, and there are umpteen scriptures today, that in verse 22 it says, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. There's an intended place for God's people to dwell. And it is always on the other end of obeying God. Amen? It is always being in a position to say yes to the Lord and no to anything that counteracts the last information and instruction we had from the Lord. I don't have time today to preach here on any of these things, but the Lord doesn't do anything. He said, I don't do anything that I don't speak it through my prophets. But I want to say it another way. God doesn't do anything that He doesn't telegraph His next move. Or tell, I don't want to say his, telegraph His next move, but he doesn't, he doesn't do anything in such a way as to not say, as I've done, go ye and do likewise. Amen? God is modeling for us things that we need to understand. He's setting forth in our our lives things that we need to understand. And the Word of the Lord, and again, I don't have time to teach and preach here today. I've got another place I want us to get to, but, but, but we see in the Word of the Lord promises from God, things that the Lord speaks. And unfortunately, if we're not careful, we'll let the world and the Facebook meme creators take stuff and And sometimes those promises are not necessarily for you and I. Sometimes those promises were for Israel in that moment, at that time, for where they were. And it doesn't mean that it's universally able to be applied anytime you read it and need to feel good about it. We understand the truths of God's revelation exist. I know the thoughts that I have for you and all these things. But if we're not careful... We can try to put handles on things in such a way as I don't really need to know God. All I need to do is have the heart assurance in my comfort zones that God is saying this or doing this. I'm telling you that that with any promise of God also comes an expectation of God. Amen? I don't just walk in the favor of God. I must walk in the light of God. Amen? Just because I know about Jesus doesn't mean that I know God. Just because I've been in church or are familiar with His Word or this, that, or another thing, those are not the criterion for the blessing of God. The blessing of God is to walk with God, to worship God, to work in the framework of God, and to allow His Word to be a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, not a suggestion that we consider. God has not called us to pick and choose from His Word. God has called us to obey His Word as we know it. And then He says, He has the audacity to say, you study to show yourself approved. Amen? There's a place and a calling and an anointing and an authority in the role of the pastor, but never am I in a place where I am to become the surrogate for your own education or the surrogate for your own understanding. I am here simply as a co-worker, laborer in Christ, and brother in the body to operate in the area of my anointing and to give to you with obedience before the Lord because that's who I answer to. But every one of us are responsible to know the Word. I can't know the Word for you. I can hear what God says and I can share with you. And I I need to study to show myself approved, but so do you. Amen? 
And that doesn't stop because you've known the Lord for 30 years. You don't get to retire from the kingdom of God. Amen. You just labor until the time comes you leave. Amen. And that happens. I, I, this past week, uh, uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, one of the great mentors of my life, a man that had great influence in our ministry and had really in the influence probably of most ministers in Indiana past. And I told a friend of mine years ago, I said, all these men that we have grown up under and have been instructed by and have always looked to as models, there's going to come a day when there'll be a changing of the guard and there'll be the passing of these men. And we're starting to see that as these men age. And I don't mean to bring anybody into a stark place of uh, dealing with mortality, but we recognize, right, that we live for a while and then we die. If the Lord tarries and, and we get our, our three score and ten, maybe by reason of strength, four score, and any beyond that's a blessing, we realize that we're moving towards that moment. And the reality is, is it's not about, it's not about how we live. Are we prepared to die? Those things are all great and good. But we realize, right, that, that, that every one of us are moving in that direction. But we need to live our lives in such a way as that though it may come tomorrow or may not come for 10 years, I'm not done with God and God's not done with me. Can you say amen? I'm not done with God and God's not done with me. But once we get done with God, and I've had, I, unfortunately, I have people in my world, I see them, they're done with God because they're done with church. They're done with religion. They're done with this. They're done with that. And they're ready to divorce themselves for, from obedience to God and feel justified in doing it because of the actions of men. But I tell you today that it is never a man that has the power to bring you to a place of decision. You make that decision and you have to decide about God, not by his church, not by his people, not by his ministers, not by people on TV, not by singers, thus, or anybody else. What does God say? Who is the Lord? What is Christ? And I need to let those factors be the motivation and the means by which I move through each day. People are going to let you down. And rather than sit in a corner with your thumb in your mouth crying about it, get up and say, I'm serving the Lord regardless of what anybody else does. And that's what I want to challenge us with today. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what the world does. We need to serve God. I read, unfortunately, that, that the leadership of the Salvation Army, a group of people that William Booth, that whole organization was built on the identity of a man with a vision and a dream and a burden from God to rescue the perishing. But they have of late taken on a posture that is more conducive to satisfying any detractors they might find in the world. And they've since come back and said this, such, and thus. But I'm not here today to mince words. I'm here to say, I don't care if you're the Salvation Army, the Assemblies of God, the Church of God, the Roman Catholic Church, whoever you may be. If you turn your back on the Word of the Lord, you're in error, and I am not following you into the abyss. I am not so attached to anything created by man or reflective of men that, that, that would cause me to ever divorce myself from God on behalf of the decision foolishly made by those who have decided to follow after the gods of this world. Do you hear me today? Amen? Go ahead and praise Him. And that's my decision, but you need to make that decision as well. And it's necessary for us. The Bible tells us it's not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And even so, more so as we see the day approaching. Why? Because the reality is, is that many times coming into the house of the Lord, sitting under the anointing of the office of the pastor or the evangelist and the apostle or the teacher, preaching, teaching, and revealing the word of the Lord has a way of keeping those scales off of our eyes so that we can see clearly through the fog, the dust, the dirt, and the dark. Amen? And it is the lamp and the light of God's Word that makes a difference. And the lamp and the, is fueled by what? The Spirit of God, the oil of the Lord. And I need God. So we can talk about finding financial balance. And we can recognize that we have the blessings of the Lord. And God's desire is to enrich us, to increase us. I don't see a parable written that doesn't have in its context the desire of God to place an investment in our life in such a way as to reveal our trust of Him, our confidence of Him, and an expression of what we've learned from Him. The one man received ten, the other a five, and another one one. Do you know how they, why they did that? Well, in today's society, they would say, oh, well, you're, 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 you're being a, a, a giftist. Uh, you gave another man more than you gave me, and everything's got to be equal. I'm telling you today that you will accept, you will receive in your life a direct proportionate reflection of what you've put out of your life and released from your life and proven in your life. Amen? Amen?
Listen to me. You don't walk in here first week and say, I'm going to be a member of the... No, you're not. You're going to come in. You're going to worship. <laughs> We're going to see your faithfulness. We're going to walk. You, 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 well, I, just, I want to come in. I'm going to get baptized. Well, let me tell you something. I'll, I can dunk you in water. We'll go down to the ocean. We'll go down to the ocean or the river today. That's fine and good. But, 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 but listen, our lives need to be more than a, a bold proclamation and declaration. You can teach a poly parrot to say praise God, and you can teach a monkey to sign language. The Lord is, is, is great and mighty. Amen. It's not enough about what you say. How do you live out your life? And one of the early on litmus tests is, are you a giver? If you say that the Lord is the Lord of my life, that you are a stingy, hoarding, miserly, ungrateful individual, a couple of things are true. Either you've never met Christ and you've only repeated the words that you've learned, or you have come to know God, but you have refused to mature, and rather than walking like men and women of God, we are walking around infants in Christ needing to be milk-fed instead of meat-fed. Or we have come to a place where we have turned our back on God and we have created our own gospel and said, I'll I like this one. I'll add this to my, my Christian wardrobe. And I don't like that one, so I'm, I'm not going to go that way. But boy, I like this one. Can I tell you today that we don't have the privilege to pick and choose, but we have the responsibility to humbly obey. We have the right to refuse God's influence in our life. That's up to us. But if I name the name of Christ, it's better for me to hang a millstone around my neck than it would be to allow somebody to step into a place where the Spirit of God and the Lord Himself is misrepresented by the way you do your business. And I tell you, it's important how we do our business. It's not important. Hey, listen, I don't care about your reputation, even though the Bible tells us. Hey, so, so don't, I, don't, I, I've had, I say that because I've been in ministry for over 30 years. I've been in pastoral ministry for over three decades. I've seen it all, I think. Sometimes I get surprised. I've had people come in from day one, tell me how much they give, how, how skilled and anointed they are, how much they can play and do this and do that. And my first question is, can you worship God? Can you be faithful to show up into the house of God? Can you love people who are unlovable? And can you let your light shine before the world that they may see your Father which is in heaven? Because it sounds like to me you want the light to be on you. And that's usually the first indication we got a problem. I get telling, letting people know where you're at, but when you come in, offering your business card and saying, here I am, blah, 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 I'm so great. Somewhere along the line, you're missing it. God didn't call us to be rock stars. He called us to be humble servants. Don't, don't get me wrong. People by anointing and by God's discretion and design can be brought to a platform of, 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 of high visibility. I say preach, teach, and believe. Not every one of us are called to national prominence. David was called, anointed of God for national prominence. But we are all called to personal greatness. God gave 10 to 1, and he had built into that gift a destiny that would exceed what the man had received if he would be faithful to take what he got and bless the Lord in a way that resembled the lessons he had learned from the man who just gave him that responsibility. Can I tell you that that man didn't just pick up one morning and decide to give this man 10, this man 5, this man 1? Do you know how he knew to individualize the, the responsibility of each of those men? Because he was in a relationship with them. He had seen how they did their business. He knew what they were capable of. He knew how uh, the conversations they had had. And this was a man who was not going to squander his money. So he wasn't going to put 10 in the hands of the one who could take one and put five in the hands of the one that could take 10 and put one in the hands of the one who could take five. He dispersed it proportionally based on relational intimacy and knowledge he had of each of those individuals. And the 10 made 10 more. And he said, guess what? You're the ruler. I'm going to make you the ruler. I'm going, I'm going to make you the ruler of 10 cities. And the other one took five and got five more. Somebody say he proved himself. I don't like any kind of theology that removes personal responsibility. I love that Jesus 
did what I could never do. But there is a predominant doctrinal mindset existing in the body of Christ in America at least that says, in all of my world, I let Jesus do the heavy lifting, and I just sit and sip uh, cocoa on the sidelines waiting for the divine bus to take me to glory. You hear me today? We're not called to sit idly by. We're called to what? Oh, I don't want to get preaching here today because it's going to come through 2022. If you'll be my disciple, let the dead bury the dead. Let others go. But you follow me. And here's what you do. You take up your cross. That's an activity of great determination and vibrancy and strength. And if the capacity to become uh, 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 depleted is heavily there, you take up your cross and you follow me. That means you bring all your junk. Listen, I, I've seen, uh, I'm not going to preach you. I could get off on the sidelines here. Listen, the Lord says, you bring all your burden. You bring all your cross. And you follow me. Well, uh, you don't know what uh, you bring your cross. Well, you don't know what my daddy did. Bring your cross. Well, you don't know what I've lived. Just bring your cross. I'm not asking you to clean up your life. I'm not asking you to make yourself better before you follow me. You take everything that has created an altar and a place of death in your life, and you throw it on your shoulders and you come follow me. You don't sit on the side and, and, and pontificate about the power of following me. You don't, you don't theoretically follow me. You don't just talk about follow me. You take up your cross and you follow me. Go sell all you have, so to speak, he said. That's not his call for everybody. God's not called us all to poverty, but he's challenged that man with an understanding in that moment that for him, the God that he served needed to be offered on the altar of, 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 of self-surrender in order for God to do what he would do in his life. Can I tell you today what God speaks to me? He may not speak to you. His truth is his truth is his truth, but we're not all in a place to hear what God would have to say to us today. But it's necessary for me to stay in a place of continuity and connectivity and consistency with God so that he can speak to me and tell me today, give your oil and your meal to the man of God. And see what I do. Do you hear what I'm saying today? It's now not time for us to just bunch ourselves like a bunch of lemmings in a corner and just do what everybody else is doing. I need to get in the word of the Lord and hear what God is saying to me. But I need to understand that in the day and hour that I live, in a place where would, the, the tendency is for self-sufficiency, we need to make ourselves available to God. Do you hear the heart of your pastor today? Do you hear the heart of the man of God today? Do you hear the heart of the Spirit of God today? He is saying, don't become self-reliant. Don't become self-dependent. He told him in Malachi, do this. Bring your tithes to me. Matter of fact, let's just read that today. Amen. In Malachi, the last chapter. Chapter, or not the last chapter, next last chapter. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. Will a man rob God, ask? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? You see, you can walk in a relationship of knowing God and not always fully understand God until you allow the Lord to speak directly to you in such a way that there's no doubt what God is saying. I always get amazed. I've always brought it up every time we encounter it during the journey of the disciples with Jesus. He would say things like in John chapter 14, it's good that Lazarus sleeps. And they were like, yeah, he's hey, it's good, it's good. He said he's sleeping. But Jesus wouldn't talk about sleeping. Do you understand what I'm saying? We can hear what God says, and we may think we even understand what God's saying, but I need to continue to spend time listening to God so we can fine-tune what he's saying. Do you hear me today? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And he says, in tithe and offerings. And he said, you're cursed with a curse. Meaning in, in, in the phrase of this, that, 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 that it's not about the religious practice of doing something repetitiously without intention or purpose. He said, you, you've even stopped doing that, though. He said, and so you're cursed with a curse, meaning it brings about its own repercussions. Can I tell you today, God's not cursing people. But when you cease to obey God, you cut off your own provision for something beyond the now. Do you hear me? I was so afraid of you, I just took your one and buried it. Really? Why? Why why didn't you just... So he he begins to appeal to him in a very profoundly uh, uh, simple way, practical way. Why didn't you just put it in the bank? At least I could have got usury out of it. 
This man's not greedy, but he's not wasteful. Somebody say wasteful. Can I tell you what kills the unbeliever today is when the church is wasteful and the church is lazy and the church wants to do the easy thing. I just want to come sit when I feel like it, sing the songs I like, say amen if it stirs me, and leave unchanged. If we walk out of here unchanged week after week, it is nobody's fault. You can't preach revival. You can't preach people into the kingdom by simple conversion of conversation and communication. We need to let the Spirit of God speak to us. And that's what he's trying to do in Malachi. For you have robbed me, even the whole nation. So he says, here's the remedy. God doesn't reveal a problem without also revealing a remedy. He said, bring, as a nation, bring all of the tithes into the storehouse. There, there may be food, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, he says, and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there shall be no, not enough room to receive it. And listen to what he said I will rebuke the devourer for your name's sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field says the Lord of hosts. Ryan, pick up, I don't know which screen it is numerically, the one that says our financial circumstances depend on three factors. What time is it? Anybody? I got my watch up here. 12? All right, my goodness, we're right there. Listen, do you hear the heart of what God is saying today? It's not enough to lend ourselves to what we've always done. We need to stay fresh, in our commitment to do it so that we honor God. But listen, go ahead and pop all three of them up there, Ryan. Our financial circumstances depend on three factors, our spending, our saving, and our sharing. Can I say that again? Our financial factors depend on three things. Our spending, if you spend too much and you don't have a budget and you're broke, it's not God's fault. If you are saving, that's a wonderful thing. Can I tell you, you need to learn how to save. Amen? You don't need everything you want. You don't everything that you desire is not required. You need to practice what what uh, uh, Dave Ramsey says is delayed gratification. If you can't pay cash for it, don't get it. Amen. So to speak. But 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 so saving is big. But then sharing. Wait a minute. Now spending. I can see. I can be foolish or wise. And savings always good. But sharing. That means I got to release. But I'm telling you today, it is not what you retain that blesses you. It is what you release. Can I say that again? It is not what you retain that blesses you. Those things can bless you. You need to know where your money is, you, all of those things. But it is what you release, not foolishly. I've been a youth pastor long before I ever became a pastor. I was a youth pastor, and they would, we would take kids to, to Winterfest, and they would get there, and the people would make emotional pleas. And I had a, a, a young man that was the size of three young men, and he told me after the first night, I gave all of my money to the offering. I said, well, that's not smart. Because I, I, I get it, I, 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 I love that your faith sees that, but you've got to know that your spending affects what else you can decide to spend on. Your savings always important, and sharing's always good. Don't want to take away from that. But we need to understand the basic principles of how God works. I said, so you're going to be fed the rest of the week, but it's because I know you have no money and I'm going to have to feed you. Amen. And so I, I get it. I never want to stop anybody's zeal. But that's why the Lord gives us instruction, information, and he gives us insight so that we know how to do it. Well, I don't believe in I, we're, I'm not going to get into that today. You may not believe in tithing, but you better believe in giving. And it's not because God's going to get you for that. I've heard pastors stupidly say a lot of dumb things in an attempt to do what I find distasteful from people in bigger platforms staying and doing the same stupid stuff. But I want to say today with great simplicity, the heart of God is first revealed to you and I in its expression of generosity as God gives. And in that revelation is a depiction of a characteristic that is a part of His nature and if it's a part of his nature, and I'm an adopted child sharing his new nature through Christ, that same DNA that's in him should be in me. 
The Bible gives us all kinds of different examples, so I'm going to stretch it here, but it means the very same thing. If the Spirit of God that dwells in you uh, is the same Spirit that dwelled in Christ, amen, that He raised Him from the dead. If that same Spirit was in Christ, it's now in me, then can I deny myself? Can I deny the expression of Christ as we see it revealed through the Gospels? If the same Spirit that motivated His activities, that cultured His heart in such a way as to please the Father, if it did it for Him, won't it still do it for me 2,000 years later? Somebody say yes or amen. Is it right? Amen? Listen. And He saw the multitudes, and He had compassion on them because they were hungry. They were like sheep without shepherds. Can I tell you, I don't care how many theological tests you could pass with flying colors. If you can look at a world in need and not have compassion, there's a problem somewhere in disconnecting from Christ. And if we are in love with the Lord and and we're linked to the Lord, then the love of God will move through us. And when we see need, we will also have compassion. And we won't have to do uh, uh, things beyond our scope. But he sought out a way to help them. And he said, and he began to ask questions. Does anybody have any food? And in that inquiry came an opportunity for God to bless somebody who would obey. And a little boy said, because he didn't calculate what he had. It wasn't about the mathematical equation of full coverage. It was just saying for him. And he could have been one of a thousand people who offered the same thing. But all we see is him. And he brought what he had. And you know what the Lord did? He didn't say, he he didn't do what I would have done. Little boy comes to me at this lunch. Say, here, I want to, you remember, do you remember, you remember watch Mayberry RFD? Andy Griffith? Remember that little kid never said anything? Uh, One time he offered, I think, Barney or, or Andy his peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And they were like, no, no, no. <laughs> they didn't want that. But here's this little kid, man. Here's what I got. Here's, here's what I like about the Lord. And the Lord received it. Wasn't too little to God. Because all God needs is a seed. We've learned that a long time ago. He received it. And not only did He receive it, He raised it. And when He raised it, He blessed it. And in doing so... He received what he couldn't give in his own flesh, and that is the power of God to take a little bit and do a lot. Somebody said, well, how important is it for me to give when our economy is doing what it's doing? It's vital that you still give. Not, it's not, the vitality is not in the giving. The vitality is in the heart to say, this money in my hands is to rob God from his opportunity to work in my life. Do you hear my heart today? Do you hear the Spirit of God? In a world of change, we need not change. In a world that shifts, variates, and vacillates, we need to remain faithful. Somebody say that with me. Remain faithful. And if we'll remain faithful, we will see an unbroken continuation of the faithfulness of God meeting us as we release to Him what He's asked us to give. And I like what it's been said of the woman with the meal and the oil. Every time she dipped out, she brushed hands with God putting back in. I don't know how you feed a nation through a famine, but God does. I don't know how you take a little and do a lot, but God does. And I don't know this, that, or another thing, but the Lord does. But here's what I do know. If I'll be faithful to obey God and respond to the promptings of the Lord, God will add His blessing and will not add sorrow. Listen, I gave all I had. Listen, the Lord, they, he, whatever they started out with, they took up 12 baskets of the fragments. I don't know how God does it. His math works different than ours. But if I'll give, what does He say? I'll give you back. And I'll, but here, here's what, I won't just match you. I listened, I, I read an email this morning from a, a ministry so happy that they had raised the money to meet matching funds. God didn't say, I'll just, I'll, I'll meet you. You give me 10, I'll give you 10. I'll, I'll give and I'll press it down and I'll stamp it out and your cup will run over. That's not my words. That's not the enthusiastic motivation of manipulative people using a microphone to get people to do what they want them to. It is the word of the Lord. Given it will be given unto you. 
pressed down, stamped out, your cup will, not maybe, might, could, might, should, it will run over. Because you're not going to outgive God, but you can certainly give like God. Amen? Can you stand to your feet today? And let's give him praise in this house today. Amen? Thank you, my God. Go ahead and put those hands together. I mean, and we're not going far. Let's praise him in this house. Lord, we thank you. Listen, God doesn't give us his word to make a burden in our life. He doesn't give us his word to add an anchor to our heart. He doesn't give us his word to, to, to cause us to crumble over in the weight of it. God gives us his word to shine a light into our path and to lift us into heavenly places that we by faith might sit with Christ and see life differently. If the body of believer in the Christ and the, and the Christ in us and the Christian that we are doesn't see the world the way, uh, we, if we don't see the world, we can't, we are not called to see the world the way the world sees the world. The child of God seated with Christ should see the world differently. And there should be a burden in our hearts, a lift in our spirit, and a lightness in our soul. Because I may be in this world, but I'm not a part of it. I am a stranger passing through. I am a pilgrim sojourning, camping out for a while. But my foundations are not here. I serve a God that is not of this world. So the God that I serve doesn't have practices entrenched in this world, but he has practices forever settled by the word. Don't be fearful today. Don't fret, rub your hands and throw in the towel and believe that it's never going to get better. I'm telling you that though we may walk through a barren land, God walks with us. They moved out of Egypt and it seemed like they should have readily moved into something else if they followed American theology. But for 40 years, they wandered in a place. Was that God's fault? No. Because their lack of trusting the Lord kept them wandering when they could have been uh, 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 living in the wondrous blessing and promise. Don't balk at God's word and don't balk at his promise. Say yes to the Lord when he asks and watch what only God can do. And he can open up cisterns in the desert. He can cause a dry old rock to give out water. He can cause the heavens to come alive with manna because that's the God we serve. And if our faith doesn't in a primary fashion see God is able to do exceeding abundantly above, we need to dive into the word until it does. You don't need more preaching from here, there, or yet another source. You just need to get in the word and let the spirit of God begin to reveal himself to you. And when God, when you know God because God revealed, Paul said, listen, he said, I went to... If you have to leave, go ahead. That's fine. We'll get the table set up. I'm not going to stop till I sense the Spirit of the Lord. Paul said, uh, he said, when I, when I came into God, he said, I, when I came into the Lord, he said, I went down to Jerusalem. I hung out with those guys for a while. But they didn't add anything to me. They didn't tell me anything new. It wasn't any grand revelation. But he went and spent 13 years down in Arabia. And he got to know the Lord. There's something, there's a limited amount of what men can ever teach. Man, when you spend time with God, it'll define you like nothing else. I've met people who have credentials and I've met people who know God. And there's a vast difference. When you know God, you have a heart. I, I, I'm not going to list the Christ. What I'm saying is this. Paul said, I got around these men. they have been with the Lord. They shared, But they didn't add anything to me. He wasn't being arrogant. He wasn't downplaying them. He's just stating a fact. They, they, they didn't do anything to make my life enriched. My goodness, when I spent time with the Lord, my first encounter knocked scales off my eyes. And the time that I spent with God changed my life. It's not about a one-time encounter at an altar. It's about an everyday encounter in His presence. We don't need to be people who own a Bible but shun it. Have a church we're a member of but never attend it. Have money that God blessed us with but never give it. Have a heart that's been changed by God but never share it. We need to be ambassadors, lighthouses, dispensers, bastions, representatives, declaring, this is what God has done for me. I don't care how many scriptures, I, I, it's important that we know scripture, but I could care less about the numerical count on your verse memorization from Genesis to Revelation. But can you in two minutes tell me what God did for you? Because that has power. 
And I don't want to just hear historically about in a moment and an event at an altar. I want to know what is God doing today? The scripture asks, what has God done today? What is the word of the Lord today? Don't you build your resume and your sense of security on yesterday and past accomplishments. Where are you with God today? If he asks, will you give? If he enlightens your understanding, will you submit? If he opens the door, will you yield? Where are you today? Oh God, don't let me foolishly live in the fallacy of believing that my yesterday is my today. It may be my foundation, but it's not my fuel and it's not my food. It's not what's happened before. It's what's happening now. Because no matter what my now is, I have a next. And if I don't manage my now, my next will never materialize. Do you hear me today? I could be stuck on floor 2-4. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. Well, I speak in tongues. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. If it's a contest, I win. But it's not. Where are you today with God? Where are you today? We need to find financial balance. We need to recognize that I'm not dependent on this world. Gas may get up to $50. If it does, we'll all be walking and riding horses again. But my happiness, my joy, my contentment, my peace, my expectation, and my hope does not lie on who resides in the White House. It does not reside on the current inflation rate. Somewhere along the line, I need to train my heart and my life to be content in Christ and in Him alone. And until that becomes the reality of our identity, then don't quit getting as close to God as you can. Your entrance into heaven is not based on merit, badges, and experiences. It's based on a relationship with God that's real. Father, today I pray in spite of the weakness and the futility of the limitations of our humanity, I pray God speak to our hearts. Help us today, O God. Help us today, O God, yield to you. Lord, let us be less concerned about what our next move is outside of this building. Let us think about the now. God, what would you have us to do? Where would you have us to be? What are you saying to us, God? What is the word of the Lord to us in this moment? God, I pray, let us find continuity in our consistent continuation in staying connected to Christ. Not to facilitating religious functionality, but Lord, to know you in the fellowship of your suffering and to allow ourselves to carry in our bodies the reflection of your afflictions. Oh God, oh God. Oh, God. Break anything in this body that is unlike Christ. Break any confidence that we place on anything other than the atonement of the blood of Christ and the satisfaction found in His blood. Oh, God. Help us to be men and women of faith, not men and women who have read the Bible or know a phrase. Help us to be men and women of faith. You understand that little boy gave out of faith. He gave knowing that if he gave to God, God would give back to him more than he left and let go of. And it takes faith. Can I tell you that you can fastidiously obey the word of the Lord, but you can do that religiously. He said, listen, your lips praise me, but your heart is far from me. You can repeat religious rhetoric. Religion, rhetoric, repeatedly. But we're not unlike the heathens if all we ever do is say words repetitiously. With their lips, they praise me. But their hearts are far from me. Oh God, let us not facilitate religious practices. Let us be disciplined in our practices, but let us not without heart repeat things solely to speak them. God, have your way in us. 
but more so in the body. Because if you'll make it personal, what happens independently, individually, will result corporately. Oh God, search me and know my heart, David said. Try me and know my thoughts. See, see, oh God, examine me. See if there's anything unlike Jesus in me and remove it at all cost. God, this isn't just about me getting to heaven. It's about the sinner hearing about the Savior. And we will have no credibility if the life of Christ is not witnessed in us and the love of God is not. Listen, you can say, I love you all day. I remember when I was in Richmond on staff and we created this system of following up people. For about the first two weeks, it seemed all right. Sincere people. And about the third week, we started getting reports back. Well, what'd you hear when you heard? They said, you're just calling us because we're on your list and you're supposed to. Can I tell you, people see through the smoke screen that we put up in an attempt to look right and righteous. But if you love somebody, the Bible says, in our wrath, let's be children. In our love, let us be men. But you understand, kids know who loves them. You could act like this, that, but kid will, a kid will know if they're loved. The world is the same way. Oh, God, move in us. Move through us. Have your way in us, God. Let us not do things just because we feel like we ought to do them. Let's let our hearts return. He said, listen, you're doing all the right things, church. In the book of Revelation to the church, you're doing the right things. You're, you're covering the bases. You're getting it done. You're feeding. You're doing all. But, but you've lost your first love. Pastor, are you saying that the Spirit of God is saying that we're all lost and lost? No, I'm saying that the danger of the hour is that we can fall into that trap. So the word of the Lord from this pulpit is to challenge each and every hearer and believer to not let that be a reality in them. Is God saying that that is the identity and the characteristic of this church? No, He's saying that it is in the nature of humanity if they are not connected to Christ to gravitate back to the likeness of Adam. And the Spirit of the Lord is urging us, go other, another way. The bridge is out if you keep going your own way. Oh, Father, help us to find balance. Help us, Father, to find faithfulness to the revelation of your word. And break us of any practices that make us feel comfortable in our conformity to previously received religious practice. And let us focus rather on the discipline of surrender and obedience. And God, today we'll thank you for it and give you the praise in the same name that we called out to be saved. And we'll say it today in great authority in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, the word of God. Amen. And amen. And amen. Whatever you surrender to God, listen.